a story is a wavelength, we could pick a beginning, follow intention to the border, then let custom reign. When we build a nation, we are permanently old and always new. Mother died a refugee. She thought the status was a promise of return. She had a version of nation under the bed. Never mind that her village took a new name. The nation, versified in these lines that I was reading from Poetry Foundation, talk about a nation that is yet to be despite its historical being. A nation that was deterritorialized, a nation that was robbed of its independent status, the de facto independent status, ironically, at a time when the world was being crafted into nation states. This is a nation that is built on a foreign land, a borrowed land with resilience, faith, and hope. A hope that keeps betraying every, every next year, every time when an elder passes in the exile community. This is the Tibetan nation in exile. And the poem that I was quoting from is Home in Transit by Saring Vangmo Dhompa. Saring Vangmo Dhompa is the first Tibetan woman to have published poetry in English. She was born in exile. She was raised in Kathmandu in India before she moved to the US for creative writing. Right now, Saring is assistant professor of English in Villa Lova University. Saring has published three poetry books. Um, My Rice Tastes Like the Lake, In the Absent Ab Every Day, The Rules of the House, two chapbooks, and her mother's memoir, Come, Chronicle of a Travel to Tibet, A Home in Tibet. Welcome, Saring, to TMYS Academy's poetry session. Thank you so much, Shelley. I'd like to begin with the discussion on exile, Saring. The role of the intellectual in exile, as Edward Said raised this question years ago. Edward Said says that the intellectual in exile has a special role to play. First, for this intellectual in exile, exile is a critical concept. And the intellectual has upon him or her the responsibility to talk about exile. The intellectual is reminded of the exiled status vis-a-vis uh, -vis past and present when his past or her past is constantly rubbed against the, 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 the present. And also in the host country, when the culture of the host country fends him or her off to the territory of non-belonging. So what do you think is the role of intellectual in the Tibetan exiled community? Or how do you see yourself as an intellectual in the Tibetan exiled community? Um. Well, that's, you know, I think that it seems like there's so many um, questions in that one question, right? The first of all, sort of who is an intellectual and then, um, you know, what, what is the role of uh, an intellectual and then in exile society? Um, so I, I think like, you know, I, I, I do um, go back to Saeed's um, definition or, you know, his view of the intellectual in, um, in, in any given society. Uh, and I think for him, it's someone who takes on a public role in society, but that of representing an, um, a view, an attitude, right, as he says, or a cause or philosophy. Um, and someone who he says cannot be co-opted, who stands for uh, values and speaks up about issues that can't be ignored. Um, and the other thing he talks about is also like someone who knows how to use language and when to intervene, right? So, which includes fighting stereotypes. And I think, you know, for him, politics is that one sphere that, um, you know, is everywhere. So I think for, for me, I, you know, I, I, I don't really think of myself as an intellectual. Um, maybe, you know, I see myself as a poet and I think I also feel like, there is such a small audience for poetry. So I never really think anyone is reading my work, right? So I, I, I don't see myself in any way. Um, People sort are of... reading your poems. Your poems are taught in creative writing curriculum. <laughs> they have made in academia. People are reading your poetry. Your poems were shortlisted, <laughs> your book was shortlisted for Asian American uh, Literary Award. So that's very humble of you to say that. But you know you are an intellectual. A poetry well, I think... intellectual. 
I mean, I think, I think you know, um, poets uh, can be seen, right? And increasingly, I think in this political um, sort of uh, climate, right? There are so many po poets who are speaking um, and who cannot be co-opted. Um, so I'm, you know, thank you for including me in that um, sort of um, group. I'm just saying, as as a as a as an individual, right? I don't um, see myself in any specific way. I just think of myself as writing, right? And in some ways, writing uh, in exile um, means, right, taking into view the politics and the state of being, and the time and the period and the community that I. Um, was raised in that I am still in communication with always, right? Even if I'm not living physically uh, within the community. Um, and as you know, when when you when you talk about the role um, of of a Tibetan uh, poet in exile, I think it is sort of you know for me it is I think to um, to, to keep the stories alive, right? To insist upon um, our condition. Right, it is a fight for freedom. It is a fight um, that we're still um, sort of in. Right, we're still in the middle of it, or uh, I don't know where we are. Right, <laughs> whether we're in the in the beginning or in the middle, but we are in it. And so, I think um, it's important. Right, exile is, um, as Said said, a, very, a discontinuous state of being, and within that uh, sort of very insecure, uh, discontinuous state, it is writing that sort of insists upon um, probably a narrative that that can stand right that can be heard mm -hmm. so that's sort of a long-winded answer <laughs> yeah but, uh, you know Buchundi Sonam the exile uh, uh, poet pub essayist and publisher uh, he says that uh, what has happened he talks about Tibetan fiction Tibetan English fiction specifically and he says that there are two very strong cliches that we have there two tropes, one is religion and second is politics. He says and, uh, these two overwhelming, overbearing themes, they kind of limit the scope of experimentation. Do you think the same for poetry? Um, do you think these, these kind of labels of being exiled, an exile writer, do you think these are uh, limiting, they're overbearing? I don't think so, right? I think that um, there's a way through language, right, to play. Um, and, you know, the experience of exile, right, changes. It's not this one feeling that, you know, sort of you live with, right? It, whether it's um, a sense of solitude. And, and I think exile is sort of reaching, right, to um, both the collective and to the very sort of personal and the private experience. Um, and within that, I think, uh, you know, there is a lot of room uh, poetry is, of course, right. It 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 is making something palpable. Um, it is taking sort of, um, I think Lynn Hajinian said, restoring palpability to the world, right. So it's making the familiar uh, very remarkable, right. And it's making um, what's uh, maybe uh, unfamiliar, right, to bring it into view. Um, so I think you know, given that we have language and there's an expansiveness in language. Uh, and in the world, I think you know um, what you make of it. I think is 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 also um, uh, the reality, right? Yeah, indeed. At, indeed, I have noticed in your poems that I have read that uh, you do not your poems are not like freedom songs. They are not about like a, a very a, a kind of a propaganda poetry or anti-China, but it is about stories. And yet, like you bring in these poems, nostalgia of the lost country, stories of. Uh, family stories of people of growing up in exile, and you also uh, honor the the culture that you that you're go, growing up in. And uh, I often wonder, like Said said, that what happens the exile must disengage with religion and the romance of it to keep the political issue alive. Somewhere I do see that this is what has happened to the exile Tibetan exile community, especially if we juxtapose it with the Palestinian community, that the political cause has become very secondary, as has been spoken by many people like Jamia and Norbu, they have often uh, sort of, you know, expressed this kind of uh, resistance to romanticization of their religion, which obfuscates the political cause. Uh, you think it happens and what do you think is a counter technique? I think, you know, perhaps it's also important to look at sort of the role of religion, right, in the Tibetan um, context in, in terms of history. Um, mm -hmm. So much of our uh, texts in the past have been of a religious nature 
And so that kind of, um, uh, you know, that, that's, that, that still has its hold. And religion, Buddhist philosophy is important. The role of lamas is important to people. And so I'm sure, you know, a language is so much sort of also infused by uh, those sentiments and those values, right? And I think perhaps in religion um, or in the philosophy of karma or, you know, however people might see it, that people do find solace, right? And I think perhaps that's the solace that um, helps them, right, through whatever this experience of exile is. Um, but I think, you know, for me, uh, the language of religion really, you know, is also a language that seems fixed to me, right? A very, very uh, long tradition of, of, of very certain ideas, which, you know, I uh, feel they do offer some way of looking at um, our condition, but I'm, I, I don't necessarily feel comforted, right, by those notions. And so, uh, you know, I, for me, it makes more sense to really take into view, as I said, the expansiveness, right, of, of the world and, and of the possibilities of uh, interpretation and playing, right, with um, interpretation and language. And I, I don't find that so much. Uh, I find that maybe Buddhist philosophy is a starting point, but it definitely isn't something that helps me, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, put everything into perspective, right? It's, it's a good starting point perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it's not, it doesn't, you know, whereas it might work for, it might make sense, right, for um, some um, writers, um, it doesn't for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, uh, what I have observed is that if, if Buddhism has disabled or it has lowered the the political cause of Tibet, the activism, but it has also enabled the same in a way because it has provided the vocabulary. For example, uh, we have we talk about environment, right? We talk about nonviolence. We talk about peace. So these are also weapons that have enabled that have that have, that have it has given a vocabulary to talk about the distinct Tibetan identity, uh, not not really as a monolithic construct, but at least what it aspires to be, or what it was in the past, or what it wants to be. Uh, a very distinct political Tibetan identity, which adheres to certain principles. So I think it's also enabling in a certain sense. Saring, I wanted to raise this point about your movement from India to the West. I was reading an essay by Professor Saring Shakya, twice removed, where he talks about uh, how exile is from one point to the other. And then from the second point, you move everywhere around the world, like Tibetans are today. It's more of a diaspora, right? And uh, do you think our second, because, the, the, because Dharamsala, the exile capital of Tibetans, that is a kind of a little Tibet, as uh, Sunning Ramgyal uh, gave the title to his book, Little Tibet, you know, Little Lahasa. It's a little Tibet, and there, there we have a version of Tibet, which is constructed by Tibetans in exile. And a lot of researchers say that, that this version of Tibet is where the real Tibet exists, because back in Tibet, it's a signified Tibet. It's a Tibet of the Chinese uh, state, a Tibet which is controlled, and it's not really where you are free to be who you want to be, free to practice your religion. You don't have the freedom of speech. What we have it in Dharamsala. We have the culture there, we have the language there, we have everything there. So do you think your movement from Dharamsala to West or other people who have uh, moved, moved away from the center, you feel that you are removed, you're twice removed? Is it, 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 has it weakened the Tibet cause? Do you think there has been more assimilation that you, uh, you have sort of, because in the exile community, when you are there within your community, there are this less fear of losing your identity because you are in the community. But when you go out in the sea of non-Tibetans, especially in the West, you think there is more of a assimilation with the Western culture, and the and the Tibet cause gets weakened in a sense. I, you know, it's hard to um, talk with such certainty, right? And and I think there is no straight progression, right? Like that, things weaken or things strengthen as, as in a linear uh, direction, right? And I think there's there ebbs and flows like anything else, right? Like the ways communities are built and disintegrate, um, the way that sort of, you know, uh, movements come and go. Um, I also don't see necessarily that Dharamsala is uh, like the center of um, Tibet. You know, what we've produced in exile is a version of Tibet, right? It's not the Tibet, right? And, 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 and when we speak of Tibet, there's so many different regions. There's so many different communities 
that are quite distinct from one another. And what we have in exile is really sort of maybe, you know, some kind of a hybrid, right, that we hold as the Tibet. You know, whereas we speak in a very specific uh, language, which is more central Tibetan language, the, mm -hmm. cus the customs are also, you know, not exactly how they were uh, in, uh, you know, they were in maybe some areas, but not necessarily in other aspects of Tibet. So I, you know, I think I would caution against sort of uh, uh, making um, also those kind of um, remarks as, um, you know, again, as comforting as they might be, right, and sometimes necessary. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I don't feel like when I go to Dharamsala, I've reached uh, Tibet, right? I have been to Tibet, and I've been to the nomadic land, and I have felt like, oh, this is Tibet, right? So I think that it depends on many different um, uh, things coming together, right? Um, yeah, and so, I mean, also moving away from um, India to, uh, you know, we moved from Dharamsala to Kathmandu. And for me, you know, um, more than Dharamsala, Kathmandu was, uh, Kathmandu felt more like I was among a community that I could communicate with because they were people from my mother's region. So immediately we were speaking in a different language, right? As mm -hmm. opposed to being in Dharamsala, which is sort of the political center, right? If you think about sort of, think of it as a capital, right? A capital yeah. doesn't necessarily stand for the whole nation, right? But it is an aspect, a political mm -hmm. sort of wing. Um, and in the same way, you know, I, I, I think, um, so moving, moving different, move, moving between different locations, um, mm -hmm. I think for me hasn't really maybe changed, um, my idea or my feeling of being Tibetan, you know, the communities that I've moved in and out of have shifted and my, my ability to communicate or be with those communities have also, you know, sort of um, shifted, right, depending on availability and time and, and the composition of the communities, you know, mm -hmm. so I think you just find a different way of um, inhabiting whatever that community is, right? And whatever articulation of Tibetan or Tibet uh, the, the community at that moment expresses. Um, you know, I, I think it's an insecure state. What remains central to me really is, is the idea of going home, right? Homecoming. And that has always remained constant, right? Like right. the idea of uh, homecoming. So I think it's more, not so much always dependent on um, community, but certain um, feelings or states that have remained constant in, for me personally. Again, this is, you know, I think for me a personal thing. Mm -hmm. See, actually, uh, historically, uh, Lhasa was considered the cultural capital of entire Tibet, all the Tibetan regions, Ando, Kham, and Nutsan, historically. And uh, Dharamsal is considered, again, the cultural capital, but I think it's because of the Dalai Lama and the political capital because of the Dalai Lama's presence there. But you're quite right, you know, it's very, what you said is very disquieting and very important. We have many centers. For example, I'm thinking about the Bon Center, the, the Bon Establishment, the Bon, the mother religion of Tibet, and the establishment near my home, uh, like near Shimla and Solon, you know. So you're quite right yeah. about this. Yeah. So, so, so starting, I'd like to talk about, since we talked about the, the various Tibets or the center, which is like you say, it's homecoming and the idea of like you carry your, you carry your center with you, right? I want to ask you about the idea of filiation and affiliation, you know? Like uh, uh, we have affiliation to our ancestral land, ancestral country, and we build, a, we have affiliation with the host nations. So uh, do you see that in your life, in your experience, these affiliation, affiliation, affiliation with Tibet and affiliation with United States where you're living right now or with India where you grew up or Kathmandu where you grew up, these overlap in terms of, for example, language that you write, that you choose to write in. Yeah, I know. I mean, of course, right? I'm like, we don't live insulated. Uh, you know, we are uh, porous creatures and we, you know, learn from and we, um, I think, you know, um, whether we uh, know of it or not, right? We are influenced by um, what is around us and um, e even in the languages that, you know, we um, speak in. I speak more comfortably in English uh, because that's what I learned in school. And I speak uh, my dialect, Kham, Kham dialect, uh, the Nangchen dialect. Um, also, you know, there's a certain feeling. Um, so I think that, you know, it's very hard to separate 
there's, there's no border right between our experiences that we say that this is now I am this and I step out and now I am something else right that I don't think you know we may we may speak in that way sometimes right but I think we don't live that way um, yeah, that's a short like short answer to <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure if I'm answering but you know these are I think I think it's so difficult right to express in language um, notions of I think nation nationalism and exile um, mm -hmm. you know I think that we write about them with with certain um, ideas of thinking that we can put into um, mm -hmm. some notion of like proximity to the feeling but I think it is it is very hard right I think that's why um, I, I think that's why you know sort of I'm also like uh, avoiding answering uh, yeah, the, spe the specifics, right? Because the minute that you try to uh, solve, it's not a problem mm -hmm. to be solved, right? Like in some ways or, uh, yeah, yeah. You've actually answered my question very well. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, there was uh, kind of when, when the Tibetan culture was being destroyed inside Tibet under the Cultural Revolution, you know, that was initiated by China. At that time, there was this idea of preserving the Tibetan identity. There was idea of you know a strategic assimilation. We the Tibet, Tibetan would stay in their exiled settlements and communities, and the idea was to preserve, and that was important because of the uh, situation at that particular time. But now, with the more than sixty years in exile, uh, Tibetan culture has it has become very international, and I don't think it's a fear of losing the culture, and it's become it's also open to being hybrid. It's also open to accepting the foreign influence, even in politics, for example, the, the traditional Tibetan government has uh, adopted and adapted to the, uh, the, the model of democracy. So I think, I think that answers your question, that answers you, exactly what you say is right, that it's very, it's very porous, we can't really define this and that. So we, have, we, we can say that we have a progressive Tibetan community, we can't say that it's just always frozen, frozen in the past, because that is what uh, we expected out of Tibetans. Uh, like when I started my research on Tibet, I always felt that, okay, Tibet is kind of some, somewhere frozen in past. It's traditional. It's about monks. But then you realize, no, 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 it's not a monolithic identity. There are many Tibetans, like there are many Indias, right? Yeah. Saring, Saring, yeah. Uh, before, before we move ahead in the second segment of discussion, I would request you to read some of your poems for our listeners. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> so I'll read from the um, first two books. I couldn't, you know, actually I couldn't find a copy of my third book. So um, I think I gave away the last copy, so I'll have to get one. So this is uh, Rules of the House. Um, and then this is In the Absent Every Day. And both these books are published by Apogee Press in uh, Berkeley, California. Um, wonderful, wonderful editors, uh, Ed Smallfield and Alice um, that I work with. Really, you know, wonderful people. Okay, um, as remembered, mm -hmm. I'm only beginning to understand how seasons affect me. Winter, snow beating street people into obedience. How mothers held back from stepping out in discreetly ornamented shoes and thin nylon socks. Mm -hmm. This is the way I count years. The winters we had fire and the summers we erased because we were in another place. I'm told I was five in 1971, even though my birth certificate states I was born in 1969. The elders count on their fingers. They have done it for a long time. It was winter, but not the kind of winter they were born into. They were wearing hand-knitted woolen sweaters. I was wearing a jacket that children born to refugees wear. When I say I am with them, I cannot say I remember. I say as I am told I remember. It is not the accuracy of the story that concerns us, but who gets to tell it? Wow, this is a power packed poem. It says so much about exile. <laughs> it's about exile, yeah. Summers are uh, erased because you are at another place. <laughs> about the date of birth, for example, like when Tibetans in exile, their date of birth is not registered, but they need to have a date of birth in the certificates for the, for the school. It's a very powerful yeah. 
I have many friends, you know, whose uh, date of birth is marked as March 10th. And so, you know, even simple things are made, um, a, a, you know, an act of resistance and an act of remembering, right? March 10th is a very significant date for Tibetans because it was the day, uh, um, day that uh, thousands in Lhasa protested against the Chinese, right? So, um, you know, sort of the ways, ordinary ways in which ordinary people mark the political in their lives, right? That's also really powerful, right? Um, so this is called Intersect. The wives were home when the photo was in progress. They, select, they selected the shirt, cleaned the brocade trimmed boots, then called for tea as men coughed dust over the plains. Mm -hmm. Rustle of deep purple silk, signature of self. Men too must have their walk. Women had their walk. A particular hesitancy was detected in some of them, which led to stray stitches in hemlines and a stated idea of womanhood. Shuffle of paper beneath skin, the creation of soil. The Mishmi Hills Monar sings a willy-nilly tune. There is no way to tell who sings more sweetly. The male has fluorescent bronze, green, or blue plumage. The female is ordinary, as is expected in the mountains, draped in brown, like widows separating rice from stone. But this is now. We don't ask how their women died. The men were in prison or in the fields. They were on their feet. They are recalled by other men. Let the dead stay in their words, the women say. They are remembered for their sons. When clouds are distraught, they rock their grief and rivers amble at their face. Fish go where they can, to the west or south. Many gather at the river bank and raise their voices. Prick the sky, they pray. But what do most of us know of the man who brings rain to the earth? <laughs> So, you know, here I see in this poem, more than the exile consciousness, there's a woman consciousness, you know, this about the lessons uh, that women learn, uh, maybe different from the lessons that boys learn. I'm thinking about uh, a paper that uh, Enrique Galvin Alvarez, he's done a PhD on your, on your, on your poems. So I'm oh. thinking of a paper he's written on this, yeah, you do not know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, always, I always think like maybe one person is reading my poetry. <laughs> So are you reading some more poems for us? Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to add to what you're saying too, right? Like when you think about sort of national narratives um, and uh, in the making of the, and in the making of the nation, right? You, you have, you know, the people who are remembered are whatever, freedom fighters or, you know, politicians or lamas. And nothing is really said of, of, of the women who support Right, families and the men while the men are out um, at war, you know, like even Chujikantu warriors. We talk so much about the, um, the, the Chujikantu, uh, you know, um, fighters, and of course we should, right? Um, but we should also remember that while they were out, they, their wives and their mothers and their sisters and their daughters were holding the household together, making it possible, right, for them to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, be. Uh, to help them with their commitment, right? So I think sort of those are the things that I, you know, I think um, we forget sometimes in, in, you know, sort of, I think, dominant narratives or uh, narratives of the nation, yeah. Right, um, but I think, but in, have... in exile, uh, I think in exile, a lot has changed. The women, they are not, especially like with your mother, who was, uh, your mother was a, uh, she was a princess. Uh, she was a daughter of a chieftain in Eastern Tibet and she came to exile and she began to work for the gov government in exile. Before that, she worked as a road construction labor and then she worked in, uh, she managed children in a school, right? She worked in a yeah, school. Yeah, she, she volunteered, school. I think, for, yeah, SOS. They had a, a home for orphans and so she, um, that was, I think, her first job working with, uh, you know, kids who had lost their parents um, crossing Tibet. And your mother was one of the first uh, Tibetan women parliamentarian. So I think uh, from then till now, from the time of Jusi uh, Gandruk uh, till now, a lot has changed in the women's plight and the roles that they have in the Tibetan exile community. Yes, yes, of course, right? It, and, um, you know, I mean, I think, you know, thankfully, right, um, it's a community that that is um, trying, right, to um, 
to to be expensive and to include. Uh, we still have a long way to go, though, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, starting, uh, let's move to the second segment of uh, this session. Uh, you know, I'd like to actually ask you, uh, since we're talking about uh, about the women rule, I'd like to ask you, you did not have a predecessor. You had, there were only just a handful of Tibetan, uh, Tibetans writing poetry in English before you. I think to be precise, we had poems by Jindum Chofi, just four poems in English in the 19, before, before 1950s. Then we had a poetry book by uh, Chong, Chongyam Trungpa, uh, Rinpoche, in English. We had some uh, Tibetan English poetry in a journal called Light Rain, uh, no, mm -hmm. not Light Rain, journal called, a journal called uh, what was that journal? Lotus Fields, published Lotus in 1980. Yeah. yeah, we had no, we really ha didn't have Tibetan English poetry. We had very little. So when you started, you tell you, just tell us about your journey as a woman, as a poet, your journey as a poet. How did you really start your poetry? In, you, uh, what are the influences on your poetry since you didn't have predecessors in the Tibetan community, especially women uh, poets? So what were the influences? What encouraged you to write poetry? You know, I think um, perhaps homesickness, right, and love. I began writing out of that. Um, so in that way, I think place has always been something that I return to, you know, and I think that for me, um, my mother was my, um, my anchor, right? And I think going to school at a very young age, I went to a boarding school. She was in Dharamsala, I was in Missouri. And then later she was in um, Kathmandu and I was in Missouri, right? So I think initially uh, I started writing out of... Um, trying to understand right? and, and to fill this gap and this distance between mm -hmm. sort of, you know, my mother and myself and, and sort of the various states of, um, you know, uh, homesickness and uh, disruption that I was feeling, you know, and I, 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 I think I felt like I could express it um, in words and, and words meant poetry in, at that stage. And I, it wasn't something that I said, let me write a poem, right? I think it was just something that I felt this is how I can express myself. And they were just meant to be um, private, right? And I have like many little notebooks that I still mm -hmm. have, you know, handwritten um, in these little um, books. Um, so I think, you know, poetry began out of sort of uh, uh, an investigation and, an, and a desire to really interpret my own sort of feelings, right? And I think um, it sort of evolved then into a way to understand the world around me. So poetry has always been an engagement with um, the world outside, right? To understand it, um, not so much, you know, I, th I think it is that balance between sort of the inner and the outer. Um, mm -hmm. and, the, and the influences I had were mostly like the few poets we read in school in India, which meant like, uh, dead white men, right? And I thought that only, a, like you could, like there was only a few people who wrote poems, you know? And I think, I, I, in my mind, I thought they had to be like famous and they had to be uh, English, you know? Because of the range of poetry that was taught to us in school. Um, and, I, and I didn't have anybody in my community who really were reading poetry also, you know? So um, it was, you know, it was just something I did um, by myself, you know, and I didn't really have anyone to speak to, but I, because it wasn't there, I didn't think much about it, you know, I just did it. Um, and I think the, pr the process of writing consistently is maybe what I, you know, really learned from. And it was, it was only when I came to the US, I think, and I met other poets, like living poets, and I thought, oh, you know, <laughs> like ordinary people can write and get published. Um, that, you know, I, I think that I, um, I started reading more and I uh, had access to more books and, you know, um, in, in Kathmandu and in, uh, in my community, I, I didn't have any access to books either, other than, you know, the books we read in, um, in school or in college, right? So, um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm still learning, right? Uh, yeah. So what I understand is there was less of outside influence. It was more of inside and that compulsive feeling to write out of homesickness, right? I think that's where I began, right? Sort of an investigation, right? So I think that, um, you know, yeah. Right. Uh, you know, once you told me uh, uh, that 
writing is abstract and then we publish when writing when we have the books published then the writing abstract efforts it becomes very concrete you told me this long back in 2015 uh, you know i like you to elaborate a bit on this abstractness of writing especially like you know when you move from juvenile poetry like when we write as kids and when you write out of homesickness and as you said you wrote to your mom so these are probably the juvenile poems so what was the leap you know what was that jump that you Sort of you know that you uh, moved on to thinking taking poetry seriously and publishing it in book in a book format so can you just elaborate on that abstractness of this abstract efforts and the con the concretization of these efforts in the book form yeah i mean i wouldn't say like when i started taking seriously right when i was writing when i was 12 i was as serious as i am now right um, you know, I think that doesn't change, right? The desire to learn, the desire to write. Um, you know, I, I, I don't diminish um, those poems, you know, because they're produced out of their own time, right? Um, I think, yeah, I, I, but I can see what you're saying, right? I, um, in terms of I, you know, when you, when yeah. I, I think when I write, I don't write with a, with the idea that it's going to be published. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I just write. And then at a certain time, um, somebody will say, oh, are you working on a new collection of poems? And then I think to myself, yeah, actually, yeah, I do have right, a collection of poems. Like, I very rarely do I uh, send po poems out. Like, you know, I know that, you know, for some people, it's very important to have a goal, like, oh, I must get published in the New Yorker. I must get published, you know, here. I've never done that. I, I just send when someone asks me, you know, do you have a poem that, you know, we'd love to have you uh, in this, whatever, anthology or in this collection. And then I think, oh, yes, I do have something, right? So I think, I think when I write, I, I'm not, you mm -hmm. know, I'm not very um, specific that it, yeah, I don't have a goal for it. I just write because that's important mm -hmm. to me, right? And that's important to the work I do, the thinking I do around, you know, these um, constant um, ideas, right? And I, I think like when you're talking about sort of the relation between sort of the abstract, what I'm thinking about, you know, the poem itself is the concrete uh, result, right? So sort of there's always this shift and then the publication is, you know, is something else, but the poem is the concrete thing, right? It's not the publication that makes it uh, concrete for me. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like when I see this book, I just think, oh, it's a book. Right. I and then sometimes I think, oh, it's my book. Right. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't. Yeah, I don't think too much about it. I think I feel the same way. I think John Berger, you know, in Ways of Seeing talks about how like the relation between what we see and what we know is never settled. Um, and I think that's sort of how I feel about the books in some way when I see the books, you know, and when I'm thinking about things and when I'm writing. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know how to explain it, but yeah. Mm -hmm. See, I, I understand. Now, I'm just thinking about this, that here we are some aspiring poets. We have these goals, oh, and uh, that we have to publish, publish these poems in some journals. We make a list of journals and we, we, we're dying to publish and we, and we send our works out and we have to face rejection, you know. And here, I, here is Sarin Kwan Dhompa, who doesn't have any such goals. She just writes because she enjoys writing. She writes and she writes and she's called, she's asked to submit poems and your poems are published in places like Poetry Foundation. That's something impossible for many of us, you know. So I think it's an approach to writing that when you are focused more on writing than on the output or the publication scenario. I think that's that's a very important thing I, I learned from you. Yeah. Well, I, I think I've been very fortunate, you know, like to be invited. And I never think about, oh, is this an important journal or is this, you know. Yeah. I think like if I receive an invitation, I always think how wonderful, you know, and, and, and I... If I have something, I do send it, you know, to them. That's, um, that's you know, I mean, it, it might be a smarter thing to just target and say, okay, I'm going to keep this poem for, for this, you know, whatever the New Yorker. But, um, you know, I think I feel like the readers have always found me, and so I, I'm not very comfortable with like promoting or, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, doing stuff. So um, I've been fortunate that 
um, I think the, the, that the readers have found me. And it was the same way for my first book. I didn't think of publication. I, I never thought that I would have a collection, you know, and a friend said, why don't you send it to this publisher? You know, they would like a book. And I thought, oh, really? And then I contacted Apogee and I said, I have a, you know, I have a collection. Would you be open to reading it? And they said, yeah, send it. And I was like, oh my God, I have to get it organized now, you know, <laughs> because I, I just thought they wouldn't, right? So, um, so yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been lucky, I think, yeah. No, you, it's not. A, it's not that you've been just lucky. It's also that because your poems are very good. Your poems have that merit. For example, I just said that your exile poetry is so distinct from many other exile poetry I read, where, which read more like propaganda literature, resistance literature, anti this, anti that, that literature. Your poem is exile poetry. It's about exile. There's a, this exile consciousness. It brims up in the poems. It surfaces the themes, but without any cliches, without any this kind of a just the same rhetoric. So it's a merit of your poem that. I think I must congratulate you for this. Oh, I I you. Well, it's not in isolation, right? I've had, I've read people who have taught me to write, right? And I think, you know, it's not, it's not something that comes organically from me. It's, it's from having labored and read, um, you know, other works, yeah. But this is what I precisely wanted to ask you was the process of writing from the idea stage to its final product, to its revisions, redrafting. What is your process of writing? poetry how do you pickle your poems do you pickle your poems do you ferment them do you leave them for time for the time being do you get back to them what's your process of writing poetry um with poetry i think you know it changes over time it has changed over time um it has also changed you know according to the circumstances i've been in there was a period when i was you know in graduate school and i was working so hard um on like trying to read uh, again and you know learning to read again that I didn't write much and so I would just take a I just had a small notebook and if I you know I would just write little lines and 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 then later when I looked at them they just didn't make sense right or I would just write small observations I didn't have um, I couldn't you know have the space in my head to write uh, poetry and I think that's because I was working so hard on you know, learning how to read other texts um, and also think about how to write a dissertation and how to think about, you know, nation and these concepts. Um, so it fluctuates, it goes in and out. But I think the process of that, right, has also made me um, think about, you know, my poems a little bit more differently and expose me to a few other writers, right, where I can now just sort of say, okay, I like this idea. I really like sort of uh, this historical detail and I'm going to take that and just put it in a file um, and then you know work on it later and then might use that sort of uh, you know insert that later so, sort of like in a document right a, a documentary kind of a way um, so I think you know sort of the way that I do now is I when I have time I'll write straight into the computer um, sometimes it's just fragments of thoughts um, sometimes it's an idea that I have and then I sort of build around it um, mm -hmm. and and then I just return to it another time. Some poems seem to have, you know, their own sort of, you know, they just, they just come out themselves, right? And I don't have to labor too much um, and they're short and, they, and they're done. And some poems I will sort of keep returning and every time I return to them, Right. I see something else there that I you know, might add or might delete. And so it's sort of this, this constant returning that I think um, I seem to be doing more of now than I used to. Right? You know, when I was writing these poems, I think I was doing them more in like sittings. Right? I would sit down and write a poem. And then you know, whether it was an hour or two hours, and then sort of I didn't really edit too much. Right? But that sort of that long time of sitting I would do. Whereas now I don't have that time. So I, I work on like sort of, you know, that repeated motion of returning. And through that process, I'm building also, right? Saying, oh, okay, last time I was thinking about this, that idea is really, uh, you know, sort of still percolating inside and I want to look at it through a different dimension. So I'll go to that other aspect of it and that'll become a different poem. So the, now it's like the poem that I'm working on now is, you know, a very, very long poem. 
um, but within it, it's sort of moving in many different directions, you know, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the question I want to ask you now, I asked this question keeping in mind the Tibetan exile community, uh, those among the community who look up to you for inspiration, not just in the community, but even people like me who look up to you for inspiration. Mm -hmm. Why is it is because you didn't have a predecessor and you, as you said that how you began to write poetry and how you sort of, you know, you, you are a, you're a drummer of your own beat, you crafted your own paths. But there are people, there are youngsters, the second, third, the, the second, third generation in exile who are somewhere stumbling. And I mean, I, I discuss, I talk to many of them and all of them, most of them, they look up to you. Uh, one thing that they often struggle with is language, you know. You're, you choose to write in English, you write in English, that's a language you studied in school and that's a language you write in. But you're not writing like the English, you're writing like a Tibetan in English. For example, in some poems, you have this expression, orange mountains of love, right? So orange mountains of love or orange love will sound very strange. I wouldn't understand that if I do not see it in the cultural context or if I don't see that it's maybe a child's idea about love or it's something particular to Tibetan. So if you can throw some light on this particular expression as an example of how you fuse your Tibetan identity or your Tibetan cultural nuances, your Tibetan emotions, or your emotions as a woman, by just Tibetan all the time, with, your, with, with the English poetry or the English language. How do you do that? Yeah, that's, you know, I don't know if I have like an answer for that. <laughs> I'll probably have like many diversions. Um, but I, I think part, like, I think part of that comes from maybe not trying too hard, right? Like thinking that there is one way of saying something or that there is one true way of saying something or that, that there is one right way of saying something. I think when we begin, you know, we, um, at least when I began writing, I thought I had to, you know, write in a specific way, um, without realizing that, you know, I can only sort of write uh well if i uh, if i understand uh how i use language right and mm -hmm. what what language means to me and i think once i began to sort of think about sort of the possibilities of the language that i have and i possess and that the experiences that i you know um th that i have being exposed to india and nepal like you know there's such such a richness right in 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 just the variety of um, even color that I see around me, right? And so how to write in a way that captures all of that, um, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so I had to sort of, you know, um, experiment a couple of times and play around, right? Not, not uh, perhaps put so much of uh, rigor and structure to the language, but let it open up a little bit, you know? And I think perhaps reading a lot helps, right? I think that for younger mm -hmm. Tibetans, you know, some of it is we don't have access to books. You know, we still, a lot of young kids who are in the camps, right, uh, in different refugee camps, some of the camps are very isolated and poor, right? They, they, they don't have a library. Uh, we don't have a library in Dharamsala, right, where you have novels and poetry accessible to the public. Right? And so I think, you know, um, uh, reading, I think, really helps, right? I learned a lot from fiction. I learned a lot from movies, you know, fr from, from, from all these other um, arts and expressions. Um, but I think part of it is, you know, not thinking that, um, that there is one formula and that there is one right way to do it. You know, I think understanding your own relationship um, to languages may be important, you know. Experimental. But, and that doesn't really sort of, you know, and, and that's like a vague kind of answer. You know, but I think it is, it is through the process of reading and writing, right? I think that labor um, that, that you understand and have the confidence then, right, to play. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say just play without understanding, right? Because then, um, you know, that, that could work sometimes, but not necessarily always, you know. Right. So it's basically reading and writing and experimenting and understanding your own relationship with the language rather than uh, imposing something onto what you're writing, right? Yeah, I think so. At least for me, that has been, you know, really important. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you know, emulating and, um, you know, working, copying a writer that you really admire. That's important too, right? That's part of the craft in the beginning. I think it's useful. But at some point, right, I think you have to sort of figure out what what is the thing that sort of, you know, makes you move, right? Like, wh what is, like, you know, how does your language move? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and seeing sort of, like, what is my vision of the, like, what do I see? Right? And how do I see? And what are the relationships that I draw between sort of things and, uh, you know, uh, and myself, right? The, like our way of seeing is, is an active thing, right? And so I think our way of reading, our language is an active thing. And when you think that it's one solid sort of, you know, fixed thing, then I think, you know, that, that also limits us, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for those tips. Now, so I think before we move ahead with the, the next set of questions, which could actually be um, a, a, a short rapid fire question answer round, I would request you to read some more poems. Oh, okay. Shall I read you um, a little bit from what I'm working on now? Please, please. Yeah. Your, so they're, yeah. you know, they're a little bit um, raw, but um, I've really enjoyed working on them. And some of it, you know, I, I bring in... Um, a lot of uh, Buddhist texts, but I'll read a section. I'll read maybe two poems. They're a little bit longish. Please get all here. It's... <laughs> so this is somewhere in the middle. It's like, um, yeah. The category of the refugee comes with benefits, they say. So we fulfill their expectations, knowledge of, acceptance of, analysis of loss, of losses don't change how we feel human. You begin to worry you have not suffered enough. If only you had scars where your bones were broken, your narrative would be reliable. Your mother was shot by the Chinese. Your sisters spent their youth in labor camps. As one who came after, you memorize the names of the dead to legitimize yourself, or perhaps it is about suffering I'm attempting to write here. The state of refugee is the state nobody wants to conquer. You are there. We cannot leave. My before and after is not the same as yours. You are the fulcrum. Before I understood your suffering as having no end, I thought imagination would cover over memory. Time heals all wounds, I said, bringing back knowledge from school. She asked, what are we to do in the meantime? One dies of a desperate loneliness, not the loneliness of being alone, but of being the one who came after. In exile, you crack peanuts between index and thumb fingers. It is also the way I write. Imagine that you are in the waiting room with an open wound and a ticket with your name on it. Through the half shut door, none of the names called matches yours. You practice patience. The best mm -hmm. you can do is hope. Year after year, she waited for her name to be called. The loss of this thing called hope comes gradually. The category of refugee demands evidence of dispossession. We must mm -hmm. tell apart the scars from war, from the hole that sprouts life. We must remember that life is suffering. Scars that never lose their itch. That's also when the Lama begins to point to karma. Everything fades except the effects of our actions. A seed no bigger than a sesame seed grows into a tree. This is also true of negative actions. The life of karma is outside the language, uh, outside the knowledge of the remembered life, karma of self, of people, of land, of history, and so on. Above all laws that govern us, whom no law protects, is the law of karma. She believed that justice would correct her mother's leap to death. The river that had helped her live accepted her to die. Remembering her, I remember not as the yak eating his way through summer flowers, remembering not losing myself to the words, nor ignoring the words, the words, the order, the meaning. Persevere, she would say, even if the words don't reach you, if the story is too difficult, do not be disheartened. 
give equal attention to a simple word as you would a complex idea. I hear her words in the words of my perfect teacher. It is as she was talking about a spiritual journey. I just want a story that does not make me think about somewhere else. So I'll just stop there. <laughs> this is mar marvelous. I was so immersed in this. It's very characteristic of your poetry where you have these very unique leaps of logic within sentences. Wonderful. Oh, thank, thank you for it. Would you like to read some more poetry? What do you want? Bardo. <laughs> Bardo. Is, is that from? I think Rules of the House, the poem Bardo. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Great to read poems that somebody remembers and likes. <laughs> Thank you. Bartol. A hundred and one butter lamps are offered to my uncle who is no more. Distraction proves fatal in death. A curtain of butter imprints in air. After the burning of bones, ashes are sent on pilgrimage. You are dead. Go into life, we pray. My uncle was a man given to giggles in solemn moments. Memory springs like crocuses in bloom, self-conscious and precise. Without blurring, details are resuscitated. Dried yak meat between teeth, semblance of what is. Do not be distracted, uncle who is no more. He does not see his reflection in the river, the arcing of speech over S as he is becoming. Curvature of spine as it cracked on a misty morning, a shadow evades the wall. You are no more, uncle who is no more. Every seven days he must relive his moment of death. The living pray frequently among, amid burning Jupiter. Oh, juniper. <laughs> oh, although Jupiter sounds good. <laughs> Communication efforts require the right initiative. Somewhere along the line, matters of motion and rest are resolved. Crows pick the last offerings. You are someone else. Uncle, no more. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I think I'd request you to explain a bit about this poem for our, uh, for our audience. Uh, about this, because this, this poem is about the culture of the, 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 the funeral, you know, the... the yeah, so, so in um, sort of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, and I think it is in many other Buddhist traditions too, right? We believe that, uh, Tibetan, uh, Buddhist belief, uh, Tibetan Buddhist Buddhists believe that, um, that after uh, a person dies, there is this period of 49 days, right, where the deceased, uh, you know, sort of the consciousness lingers on in the world before it makes its next journey and finds the next, you know, life. And so in that period of 49 days, the living, uh, you know, um, uh, do all kinds of prayers to assist the dead, right, to sort of, uh, because it's a painful process for the, for the, for the dead, because they think that they, they don't know that they're dead, right? Or that, that awareness comes in momentary bursts as I, um, I could be completely wrong, but that's what I um, uh, remember be, being told. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the role of the, the, grief, the grieving um, uh, living members is to sort of, you know, um, help and uh, assist the, the person who has died, the consciousness to sort of accept you know, death and to sort of help them move on, right, into their next um, life. Um, so this is sort of talking about this process, right, of, um, of, of trying to, um, you know, remember that the person who, who is no, no longer there suffers just as intensely as uh, the ones who remain and, you know, are living with their loss. Um, and so I think, you know, it, 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 it was sort of, it was, it was helpful to me, you know, the process of writing it uh, and thinking about what it means, you know, um, what is this sort of idea of death and grieving and this um, idea of rebirth. Um, I think as a tradition, as a, as a way of uh, living with grief, it is, I think, very helpful. Um, 
instead of you know thinking a person is dead you have a memorial and then you know you just move on right um here that there's a space for in the 49 days there's a space that's created you know for uh, for grieving um for having a community to grieve with but also remembering right that um the person who has died is also still suffering and needs to be um you know helped in the process um mm -hmm. you know after you've explained this i want to go back to this poem i want to read the poem again seriously mm -hmm. but now i have to actually go to the next round of rapid fire uh, sub questions i'm oh, going to ask you <laughs> no it's not a it's not a gk <laughs> test it's a it's competition it's just some personal <laughs> questions some questions about your life about you that i'm going to ask so the first question is that what are the two most precious material possessions that you have photograph of my mother and myself i will if i can i will take you to it i take it with me everywhere wow i'm an honor to see that oh uh, <laughs> this thing and your mom i you i can show it in a better light yeah so this is when i was 3 mm -hmm. um and this is you know just looking at this photograph um i don't know gives me a lot of um yeah you can see you know the love there and i think uh, that's 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 mom. always something that sort of grounds me right yeah yes i haven't told anybody i haven't yet spoken on this session about your mom but uh, suddenly lost her mother when she was 24 that's been a turning point of her life and all the works she dedicated to her mothers and i call her the indian shravana kumar she carries her mother in her heart and her poems her books are like stupas built in memory of her mother mm -hmm. so thank you for answering that question sarang and thank you for showing this uh, photo it's a very beautiful moment that we have here at tmbs academy this session i cherish this thank you <laughs> i i move to the next question what are the two most precious memories you have from childhood No that's really hard. I don't think I have any like one or two, two or three. Specific. Yeah. Um I think they would just be, you know, the moments with my mother really. You know, I All think you know just I have, you know, specific sort of uh images more than like memories, right? Like um I just have uh specific images, you know, of moments when I don't know we'd go out uh at night to the bathroom you know because we didn't have a bathroom in the house and we'd go together you know just those everyday sort of um moments that 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 were a routine right perhaps that provided a sense of routine in a very unstable life you know so yeah so just images i think yeah going to the bathroom at night and you know just um lying uh in bed and talking to her in the dark right we had always lived in one small room and we all, our beds always faced each other and we just always you know sort of in the morning i'd wake up i'd see her you know at night i would look and i'd see her right? so till she was alive we always slept in the same room yeah mm -hmm. uh all right so when sarang is 80 year old where would she be and what should what would she be doing Oh. You know I have no idea. I have never thought I would live that long. So 80. Maybe taking mm -hmm. a walk and gardening mm -hmm. and writing and reading and writing. Not any different okay. from now, I hope. <laughs> All right, but but which place would you be? You be you lived in Kathmandu, India and the US. Where do you see yourself retiring? Which which place would you want to go after retiring from work? Well, you know, if I had my way, it would be in Tibet. Mm. And I still haven't lost that desire, right, of homecoming as I said, right? Mm. Um that's always crucial. So for me, you know, that would be um the ideal place, yeah, with my family in Tibet, yeah. Uh Sarang, uh what are the most encouraging words you've been told ever? 
Hmm. Maybe, you know, keep honest and the work will stay honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right, honest. I think this is a very beautiful poetry session. This is one of the best sessions I've had so far. Very honest session, very honest. <laughs> Thank you, Sering. Thank you so much you. For, for coming to Team Vice Academy. I'm thankful to Kuril Das Gupta for, uh, for this opportunity to discuss poetry works and life with you. And I really I will cherish this for long. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you for being such a, you know, um, uh, reader and uh, you know friend and also you know um, editor you know <laughs> um, yeah thank you and th thank you so much Koro for um, creating the space